last couple of months I've been really looking for a DMU for the layout. It's something that I've just had a void of vacancy in the rolling stock that I own that I have never owned a DMU or a really an iconic DMU so to speak. I mean I run a modern image layout with preservation steam and all that sort of jazz and that's fine. I mean I've never really prescribed to the one era type of thing but I always find a model that I like, I like the livery of and I buy it. That's really what model railway should be about. Everyone's got their own preference, that's just mine. So when I got the opportunity to buy the new Backman Class 158 I had to leap at it. I honestly did because these things sell so goddamn quick it was amazing that I even got my hands on this one. So. That being said, I present to you the Barkman Class 158 with DCC sound. It's got to get it in shot, this is difficult. Um, and my god, it's a pretty thing. It doesn't look like much, really, it doesn't, but this, this is already like exuding quality. And I don't think I've been this excited for a Barkman locomotive, especially since I bought the Blue Pullman back in 2012, which, to give you an idea, was the last time Barkman probably went all out on a model to that extent. That Blue Pullman is still, to this day, one of the most... Um, well, it, it still craps on anything else that they've made in the recent years. It is just the pinnacle of what model railroading can be, and they knocked it out of the park when they did the Midland Pullman back in 2012. And... From all accounts, everything that I've seen about this model so far suggests that they've done it again. Um, this is not a cheap locomotive by any means. This is 480 Australian dollars right here. And the funny thing is, the mad bastard that I am, I've actually got two of these on order. So this one arrived today almost a week earlier than I expected it to. The other one is coming, which might not show up for another month. I don't know. Two cars wasn't enough for me, so I got thought... Bugger it, I'll get two. I usually always get things in pairs anyway, just because that's how I weirdly operate. Um, that being said, well, this one's here now, so I'm super excited just to crack in. It's first time I've touched the box. This literally just came out of the parcel about 10 minutes ago. So let's get cracking. Let's open this up and let's see what all the fuss is about. I mean, most people have probably already seen the reviews, but as is normally the case with my channel, I'm always the last person to review anything. So, as usual, Bachman's lovely blue box. I mean, the one thing I've always appreciated, especially in the more recent years, is that they've departed from the old school blue ribbon style box to this nice, crisp, clean looking box. And it's really nicely defined. It's a nice distinguish, distinguishment and differentiation from the Hornby red boxes. Hornby's red, Bachman's blue. I guess that's just a nice tribalism to it. But, um,. It's just clean, that's all it needs to be. So, what does it say? 204 class 158 multiple units were built by Brel Derby, blah, 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 between 1989 and 1992. So these things have been around for a long bloody time, over well over 30 years now. So, um, testament to the design and engineering of these class, even back in 1989 when they were first designed. I mean, here in Queensland, we've got locomotives that have been in service since 1988. Um, the Queensland Railways, EMU locomotives and their howling old-fashioned electric multiple units that have served our state for well over 30 years and they've only just started retiring them now but um, yeah so look, this is this is interesting stuff it's it's nice that they include this stuff in because I'm not really up to speed with this as much as I am with other classes of locomotives uh, one of most units had the Cummins NT855R engines well Cummins well they're well known over here this class has carried a huge variety of liveries. So when somebody says that, that's usually the reason they even go to the extent that they have to design this locomotive. Given that this class has been operating for 30 years in such a stupid amount of liveries, and I, I'd probably understate that, somebody could probably tell me how many liveries these things have run in. I know for a fact that these have changed liveries more often than shoes and socks. So <laughs> this is going to be um, really, really cool seeing this. Anyway, enough talk, let's open this bad boy up. Um, nice, simple, heavy duty box. Okay, nice. Destructions, always good to have those. Nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. 
First time in all, I think I've ever seen Barkman go to like the leaflet style of instructions, which is really good because one of the major problems I have with the Hornby stuff is they make it out of that sort of parchment paper. And um, unless you're maintaining them all the time, it gets really, really hard to, they fade as well, by the way, those Hornby instructions fade unless you keep them well stored. Let's have a look. All right, really, really interesting. So this is actually running a Zemo decoder. So many, many years ago, the first variations of DCC sound like a motors that Barkman did all used ESU. Um, the early DCC sound diesel electric locomotives, the Class 66, the Class 55 Deltic, which was my very first DCC sound locomotive, all used the ESU V3.5 decoders. Still very, very good decoders by today's standards, but they're a little bit low behind. Zemo, on the other hand, is a brand of decoder that I've never had any particular um, experience with or exposure to. So this is really, really exciting for me. Um, by any standards, ESU and Zemo are sort of regarded as the, the gold standard decoder manufacturers these days by a long way, which is why I went with the ESU architecture for my command station, which is why I'm progressively changing over to ESU decoders and ESU um, accessories on the layout where possible, where it's financially possible to do anyway. So anyway, you get the standard instructions, engine start, and yep, all the standard goodies. Okay, function tables, that's really, really handy, so we'll keep that on hand when we do the sound review. Right, here's the fun stuff. Join the Barkman Collectors Club. What do we get this time? Free wagon in either OO or in scale. Calendar at the end of the year, Barkman. Uh, personalized membership card. Oh, very nice. Four copies of the quarter of Barkman Times. See, I don't know what's happened with this collector's club, but I think years ago you used to get a locomotive exclusive. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, I've never really partaken in this, but um, maybe one day. Who knows? I think Barkman themselves are going through a bit of a transition, much like what Hornby was back in 2012. They've had some manufacturing issues, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how they come out of this on the other side. But uh, nevertheless, so this is the important stuff right here. We've got accessories, which is very unusual for this manufacturer they don't normally do accessories to that extent exhaust pipe frame extensions coupling tool okay nice so it looks like what they've done is they've got like a it almost looks like a computer motherboard header that they're using is the connector between the two coaches which is really really nifty i think that's quite good coupling uncoupling all right so it's a little pry bar nice plux 22 so Plux 22, that's the first time I've also seen a Plux 22 chip used in one of these. Usually it's a 21, but this is a 22. So <laughs> this is really cool. Um, chassis light feature switches. Okay, nice. So we can change all cars interior direction lights around. Okay, nice. See, these sort of things are really what I, I like about when a, when a manufacturer goes all out of model, you just get surprised by the detail. And I think this is really going to be a situation like that. So... Um, that seems like the light one, although they seem about the same weight. So which one's got the motor in it? Let's try this one. Doesn't want to come out. Alright. Oh, that new box smell. Doesn't that smell good? Okay, wow. This seems the light one, so this must be the trailer car. So what we'll do, we'll just get this stuff out. I'm going to leave the accessories alone for the time being, just because I don't think there's any point fitting them on camera. There's not really anyway. Um, okay, that's one. Let's do number two. You know, normally with this kind of packaging, they just slip out. Like, like when you buy a new iPhone, the box just sort of slips on its own. Um, this one's a little bit harder to get out, but I understand that they're trying to protect precious cargo, but my goodness. Okay. So this looks like the coupling tool that they just mentioned in the instruction, little pry bar. Um, we might just keep that to one side because we're going to have to couple these together at some point. Okay, interesting. 
This, you know, it feels really, 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 really light for something that's supposed to have a motor in it, but it looks like both units have got motors in them, which is kind of surprising. Um, I'm not complaining by any means. I mean, if you look at the Hornby lo logic, they just put one tiny little motor into a class that's probably going to operate more coaches, like the Pendolino that Hornby's about to re-release. Believe me, if you try and run nine cars on that particular unit, you're going to burn the motor out, because I've done that about three times. So, um, yeah, interesting. So, there we are. It's a lot lighter than I was expecting it to be, but that's probably a good thing, because, um, yeah, they're definitely both motorised. All right, let's, let's have a look at this thing under closer inspection. It's just a subtle nod to our friend at... Uh, New Junction. So, gee whiz. Hopefully the camera's picking up on the detail. If it's not, I'm just gonna have to fiddle with the zoom. So, I mean, straight away, the undercarriage detail is sensational. Um, so, it appears that this is the motor bogey here, but what's powering it is... Oh, no, actually, you can see it. So, that appears to be the housing for the motor there and you can actually just make out the drive shaft going to this unit here so it looks like it's a small motor which is interesting i would not have picked that um hopefully it's still a five pole motor but if it's not i think that shouldn't really be a problem if both of them are motorized and look at this chunky look at check out this chunky connector it honestly looks like something you'd see in a computer that you connect a um a header or something like that to but um it's a welcome addition because the heavy duty of these things are, the harder they are to break. And believe me, these things are really, really sensitive. The blue Pullman always was very sensitive, especially when you tried to couple it together. Uh, but that detail's outstanding, look at that. Now, I'm not a livery expert, but to me that looks really, really nice. And of course, the iconic front end of this it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of Darth Vader. I mean, it, I know it probably doesn't to most of you, but it kind of just reminds me of Darth Vader. It's got this really, really masculine hardline chin on it, the dam, which just really makes it look fantastic. So, well done, Barkman. This looks fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I suggest the other unit looks exactly the same, but we'll just examine it. And sure enough, the motor housing in there, you can see the flywheel just going through, but the undercarriage detail is honestly incredible. Um, pickups, it seems like it's a really nice free roller, which is good. Um, I'm trying to see where I can find the switches for this function stuff, but um, it doesn't appear to be on this one. So, it doesn't appear to be on this one. Oh, no, no, there it is. Okay, so just hidden right up in there. Under the front buggy, you can see there's little micro switches which just controls your uh, your unit light settings. So I think for the sake of spending all this money, I'm going to use them all. I'm not going to isolate one or two for prototypical accuracy. Believe me, I don't really care about that, whatever. Whatsoever. Anyway, so first impressions. Gee whiz, golly. Golly gosh, Batman. Um, really good stuff, Batman. I think the quality of their packaging is as always really really good um, it's improved many many times over since the first first iteration of locomotives I bought from them probably 10 years ago uh, this seems like it's just going to be a really good runner um, don't ask me how I know I just have a feeling it is so what we'll do we'll just um, we'll cut to the test track we'll get this thing programmed we'll see if we can fire up the sands and listen to it and do a little bit of a run in and just sort of See how good this thing really is. So we'll be back in a second. I just thought I'd film this because, you know, looking at this, this is not an easy process. So we're just going to very, very slowly couple this together. Just keep in mind that this is really, really fine pins. It's almost the same as a Decatur, but this is not an easy thing to locate, which is probably why they suggest using the tool. Just very gentle finger pressure, and you should just hear the snap like that. And the unit's coupled. Simple as that. That's not coming apart. It's nice and closely coupled, which is really good. So we'll get it on the track. Okay, we've got the 158 on the test track. Um, a bit messy here today, but that's okay. I'm trying to fix this Hornby Class 90, but I don't know if there's any point. To be perfectly honest. 
just a nice chance to refresh on some people that have always taken an interest in the ESU ECOS. So one of the things you can do with this unit is you can just go New Loco, Create Manually, Advanced, and you can click Start. And this will read through all the CVs for you automatically. So what we should be seeing is that this unit should be powering up, slightly moving. So you can see the headlights are flickering, which just means that the ESU is going through reading all the CVs and programming. It's pulsing power to the units to get power through it to make sure it's both sending and receiving information from the decoder, which is a really nice feature. And in record time, it looks like it's nearly done. So this should be very quick. So Dakota read success, okay, awesome. Interestingly, it says it's only got 35 CVs, which is kind of hard to believe, but we'll, we'll wait and see, right? So we'll just give this the number 1581, enter. Okay. We'll use the longer address, we'll enable Railcom. All right, let's fire it up. So first things first, function one, or function zero, headlights. And do they come on? Probably not. All right, so the locomotive's now programmed on the ECOS. You can probably see the headlights just flickering a little bit. But I can tell you now, I can only barely hear the motor and considering the size of the little motors that are in there. Um, yeah, wow. Very nicely done, Barkman. Very, very smooth. So what we'll do now, we'll put it on the test track, or sorry, the layout, and we'll just get a sample of some of the sound functions. See you in a bit. So just in case anyone's curious as to why this model is so expensive, it's details like this. Let's check this out. The door open warning light has come on, and as soon as we press function 8 again, how cool is that? <laughs> 